On Sunday, May 27th, 2001, Mennonites gathered in Novopetrovka, a Ukrainian town that was once a Mennonite village called Eichenfeld. Under this open field, beneath their feet, had been discovered the 12 mass graves where the remains of 84 Mennonites had been buried hastily on the evening of November 11th, 1919. Now, 82 years later, a service was held and a memorial stone unveiled to honor the 136 dead Mennonites who had never been given a proper burial due to the present danger at the time. In the fall of 1919, a series of massacres were committed, resulting in the deaths of over 800 Mennonites, accompanied by other heinous crimes. The Eichenfeld Massacre was one of these massacres. Afterwards, Eichenfeld ceased to exist. One Ukrainian villager said not a single German home remained standing in the village. They were torn down. People traveling to Dnipestroy didn't want to pass through here. It was like a black hole. But who were the perpetrators responsible for the massacre? Why did they kill defenseless Mennonites? And how did the massacre unfold? Using eyewitness accounts from survivors, we will piece together the Eichenfeld massacre and answer these questions once and for all. And we will uncover a truly sinister plot twist about who was actually responsible for the massacre. If you want to purchase any of the books referenced in this video, please use my affiliate links down in the description below. Let's get started. The first Mennonites had arrived in Russia in 1789 with little to nothing. Here in South Russia, now Ukraine, the Mennonites kept their heads down and worked hard. By 1911, the Mennonites owned over 50% of the milling industry and were responsible for producing 10% of the region's agricultural implements. The Tsar's government saw the Mennonites as model farmers and sponsored them to apprentice Ukrainian and Jewish farmers as well as the nomadic Nogai Tatars, so they could adopt Mennonite practices and replicate their success. At the turn of the century, one Mennonite, Jerhar Lorenz, described the Mennonite colonies as like an oasis in the steppes. However, with success came envy. Not everyone appreciated the Mennonites' contributions and prosperity, which had been the case for centuries, as Helmut Hubert wrote. Prosperity in the Mennonite areas brought them respect for their industry and skill, but also generated envy and resentment among their neighbors. Sean Patterson wrote, Largely unaware of the coming storm, the Mennonites built their commonwealth as an oasis in the dry steppe, a city on the hill for all to envy. But in 1917, the Mennonites' golden age in Russia came to a sudden end. In November 1917, the Marxist Bolsheviks took over Russia by a forceful revolution. The Bolsheviks were a radical left-wing political party who established a socialist government. With the goal of eliminating inequalities by any means necessary, the Bolsheviks labeled the more prosperous peasants in Russia as kulaks, meaning privileged farmers because they insisted, according to Marxist doctrine, that the kulaks' greater relative productivity and wealth was conclusive evidence that they were robbing, exploiting, and oppressing the less wealthy peasants around them. In November, the Bolsheviks officially adopted the policy to liquidate the kulaks called dekulakization. To accomplish their mandate of equality and the deliverance of justice, Vladimir Lenin, the leader of the Bolshevik party, called for nationwide violence against the millions of peasants classified as kulaks, a classification which included Mennonites. Lenin declared ruthless war on the kulaks, death to them, ruthless suppression of the kulaks, those bloodsuckers, vampires, plunderers of the people. Lenin instructed, rob the robber, you peasants, you workmen, were robbed by the wealthy people. Now get back everything that you have lost, take everything that you see, and do not care about what you do. This violent revolutionary rhetoric fomented murderous envy and resentment towards peasants who had a little more wealth. It created a victimhood mentality and a lust for vengeance. This began a Marxist class struggle all across Russia. In the book Reflections on a Ravaged Century, Robert Conquest wrote, Thereafter, a Marxist conception of class struggle led to an almost totally imaginary class categorization being inflicted in the villages. 
where peasants with a couple of cows or five or six acres more than their neighbors were now labeled kulaks and a class war against them declared. The millions of Russian peasants who were labeled kulaks were not classified according to objective criteria, but instead were classified opportunistically by their neighbors and state officials. In his book, The Volga Germans, Fred Koch wrote, The owner of a single cow, no matter how aged or scrawny she was, might find himself so labeled by a proletarian accuser, particularly if the latter wanted the cow. Lenin's pronouncement gave every burglar, thief, robber, extortionist, and swindler license from the highest authority in the land to seize another's property and goods with impunity. The great mass of people in the colonies who had accumulated anything at all in material things during a lifetime of industry, good management, and frugality were now declared prey for freebooting and criminal elements. With the Civil War raging, law and order had completely broken down, and dozens of smaller revolutionary factions roamed freely, pillaging and killing, eagerly following Lenin's instructions. The Mennonite historian Gerhard Lorenz wrote that these bands roamed the country claiming to be fighters of freedom and justice, but in reality were nothing more than the scum of society and aiming at nothing better than plunder, murder, and rape. In his book, Fire Over Zagradovka, Gerhard wrote, Soon the Ukraine was in flames. Practically nightly, one could see the reddened sky reflecting fires. The estates and the homes of the well-to-do were burning. One did not need a particularly active imagination to surmise what was going on in these places. Rape and murder, and senseless destruction of valuable property. But of all these smaller revolutionary factions, the Mennonites most feared the Machnavists. Named after their leader, Nestor Machno, the Machnavists were an anarcho-communist army who fought for the elimination of the class state and economic inequalities, and to introduce an economic and social system based on the principles of social equality, justice, and fraternity. Although their slogans of equality and justice may have seemed praiseworthy and righteous, their actions would prove otherwise. In his memoir, Bernhard Dick gives a description of the typical raid that Mennonite villages suffered through in 1917 and 18. The bandits always grabbed the men first. At first, the men were severely tortured in order to obtain money, gold, silver, and other valuables, if such were still available and then they were either killed or tied up helplessly. After the bandits had robbed the house, the women were locked up and victimized, inconceivably sad, but so true. The temptation to form an emergency selbstuch, self-defense unit, did not arise suddenly overnight, but grew in our men gradually through months of unbearable and catastrophic experiences and unprecedented terror. There was, for example, a 30-year-old, sincerely devout married man, a certain HP, who told me that it had become quite clear to him where his duty lay when he saw in Hobstad the first abused women from the German Lutheran village of Preisdab who were bleeding and whose breasts had been cut off. His one and only thought was, I've got to get home and grab a rifle. Another Mennonite stated that he joined the self-defense unit because he must protect his mother and other village women from Macno and his bandits. Given their pacifist tradition, Mennonites became divided over the action of self-defense. However, small self-defense units were formed for the prevention of murder and rape. The Chortasa Mennonite colony established a self-defense unit similar to this one, with 250 men, 18 of whom were from Eichenfeld, who fought alongside other German colonists and successfully repelled waves of bandit attacks. However, in 1919, the Bolshevik Red Army and the Machnavists, both communist armies, entered into an alliance to defeat the volunteer White Army, considered conservative and right-wing. And in September, the Machnavists won a critical victory against the White Army, giving them complete control over a huge area of land, which included five Mennonite colonies, Chortasa, Malachtana, Yasikovo, Zagradovka, and Borisenko. The prominent Machnavist Peter Oshinov described this takeover. They literally swept through the villages, towns, and cities like an enormous broom. Kulaks perished in great numbers. By late October, Machnavists were once again pillaging Mennonite colonies. 
in addition to the looting and killing, was mass rape. John Toes wrote that by 1920, at least 100 women and girls who had suffered such violations were still being treated for syphilis in Chortiza alone. Similar conditions existed in the Malachtana. Eichenfeld resident David Quiring wrote, We prayed to God that he keep the bandits away from us. We prayed that he would free Chortiza from the power of darkness. You have no idea how we who were living nearby felt especially as this dark cloud steadily approached. On November 2nd, Dietrich Neufeldt, a Mennonite teacher, wrote in his journal, It's getting more and more dangerous. Macno has ordered his intelligence agents to finish off without mercy every person of hostile views. On November 4th, Macno published a violent news article stating that he had assigned his chiefs with the task of eliminating the bourgeoisie and their minions. He ends with, death to the bourgeoisie. Long live the social revolution. This is the leader of the anarcho-communists giving the go-ahead to exterminate anyone perceived as a class oppressor. On the same day, while in Chortisa, Dietrich wrote in his diary, We feel as if we have been condemned to death and are now simply waiting for the executioner to come. Those who are not sunk in apathy are thinking of escape. But we have been notified that anyone caught three steps from his house will be shot without warning. Actually, there are so many armed riders around that any attempt to escape would mean certain death. In Neufeldt's next journal entry, he wrote, There has been a terrible massacre. On the morning of November 8th, thousands of Machnavists passed through Eichenfeld. At around 10 a.m., they killed a man who they thought to be Heinrich Heinrichs, who had been the leader of a self-defense unit, but they killed the wrong person. The Machnavists then came into the schoolhouse where they found the six evangelist tent missionaries. The wife of the school teacher watched through a classroom window as these tent missionaries were taken across the street to an empty shed where all six were killed. According to one account, the missionaries were asked to show their papers or vouchers, which were clearly marked ministers. Macno's men distorted this to mean minor officers, to suit their own evil intentions. A missionary who survived the massacre stated that the Macnavis frequently referred to the missionaries as servants of capital. The Macnavis had identified these missionaries as class oppressors, and exterminating them was simply following orders. Then, at nightfall, approximately 400 armed men on horseback charged into Eichenfeld at full gallop. Armed guards were stationed at both ends of the village, so that in Leona's words, no one could escape. Helena Martins writes that they immediately took up their quarters and homes, and then began to rob clothing, valuables, and food. In every house there were 8 to 12 bandits, who ordered everything imaginable to be prepared for them and served before them. In the evening, the rampage begun. One neighbor knew nothing of the next. In the brutal massacre that followed, all male homeowners and their sons were systematically executed. During the massacre, a Mennonite named David Quiring was assigned the terrifying task of going door to door informing other Mennonites to bake bread for the Machnavists. His account is unique for its detail. I walked from yard to yard even though I felt fear and trepidation. The village teemed with Machnavites. When I entered one yard, I was surrounded by Machnavites. They readied their weapons to fire on me. When I informed them of my mission, they let me pass. Now and then I heard gunfire. Many inhabitants were being shot as I walked through the village. Every yard was filled with Machnavites. There was shouting and swearing, interspersed with the crying of the widows and orphans whose husbands and fathers had just been killed. While performing this task, David Quiring was taken to the Machnavist commander. The commander placed his revolver against my temple. Do you have any land? I answered that I had neither land nor a house, a statement verified by Mrs. Clausen. I was freed. Later, David was confronted by Macnavis again, this time while with his family inside his brother Jacob's house. They interrogated my brother Kloss. I came to his defense and they freed him because he possessed no property. Then it was brother Jacob's turn. Did he have land? He answered yes. The commander shouted for him to remove his clothing. 
As brother Jacob took off his clothes, the soldiers divided them amongst themselves. The commander ordered his men to take Jacob outside. The next morning, David writes, we found him dead on the manure pile. My heart still bleeds today when I think back. The victims on the west side were hacked with sabers, while those to the east were shot. The homeowner Heinrich Hildebrandt and his son David were both shot to death, as was Peter Block and all four of his sons. The homeowners David Walk and Cornelius Pauls were also shot to death, as were so many others, whose pictures I unfortunately have not been able to find. However, those who did not own homes were spared. David Quiring and his son had only been spared because they were renters. Clausen recalls, Grandmother lived at the end of the village, not in the farmer's row. She was landless. Because of this, my brother and father stayed alive. But the vengeance was not limited to class resentments. The historian Marianne Jansen wrote that during this period, the Mennonites and the German colonists suffered the most, for they were comparatively rich. Lorenz wrote, Since the Mennonites as a group belonged to the successful German farmers, their extermination was a foregone conclusion. The simple fact that they were prosperous justified their death sentences in the eyes of the Macno bands. And this racial resentment was very present in the Eichenfeld massacre. One example is documented by an Eichenfeld schoolteacher, Isaac Epp, who wrote, One bandit walked into the house and was met by Ruddicop. His wife escaped. Are you a German? He asked bluntly. Yes, I am. We have orders to kill all Germans. A shot was fired, and Redekop fell dead. Then they shot to death three other Mennonites. One young girl had just lost two family members to executions, and was now hiding in the attic with her sister, while bandits looted their house. She writes, Father sat down in the corner of the small room. There was silence. Suddenly he said, This is terrible. I could never have imagined this. Then they came to get my dear, dear father. The soldiers screamed at him, and he could not say goodbye. He showed no fear, no lack of courage. He never returned. During the night, we encountered many dangers. The evil men were drunk and wanted women. That was horrible. And by all accounts, what came after the massacre was the most horrific of all. A survivor stated, The night that followed is simply beyond description. Mothers and daughters, new-made widows and orphans, were forced to become the playthings of the murderers. Worse than anything, worse than death itself, was the horror of wholesale rape. Leona Gislason wrote, The school teacher's wife, who earlier had witnessed the murder of the missionaries, was raped beside her husband, who lay on the floor gasping his last breath. Helena Martins, a survivor, writes, Women and even 12-year-old girls were raped, manhandled in a variety of ways, and infected with venereal diseases. The morning after the massacre, 84 Mennonites lay dead. 81 men and 3 women, all captured male homeowners and their sons, had been systematically executed. Dozens of women from homeowning families had been raped and cartloads of loot and personal belongings had been hauled off. As David Rempel wrote, Armed to the teeth, these marauders adopted the Bolshevik slogan, Plunder the Plunderers. Nestor Makhno was not present during the massacre, and we'll never know if he ordered it. However, Dick, Toes, and Staples wrote, Still, their disciplined, purposeful actions and clear-cut criteria in singling out their victims bespoke careful planning. And in Macno's territory, Macno was the chief planner. Macno exercised close military discipline over his forces, and it is almost unimaginable that the Macnovists carried out the massacre without his approval. But what makes the Eichenfeld massacre so eerie and so sinister is the fact that after the massacre was over, Ukrainians from neighboring villages descended on Eichenfeld, looting whatever was left. Razia Grzada, a resident of Nova Petrovka, shared her mother's story who had witnessed the looting. Later, some daring people from neighboring villages came after everything was deserted. They took all the doors and windows. The Germans had everything of the best quality. Big two-story brick homes, fine wooden floors and ceilings, not a single German home remained standing in the village. They were torn down. People traveling to Denis Pestroy didn't want to pass through here. 
In his memoir, Gerhard Schroeder wrote, Eichenfeld was a very prosperous Mennonite colony, thus constituting a highly desirable prize for looting by Macno's men, and then to be turned over for the wholesale plunder to some of the neighboring peasant villages. Margaret Epp, who interviewed survivors, also concluded, It must be admitted, their Russian neighbors, many of whom had long envied the prosperity of the Mennonites, had gleefully swarmed through the village, laying covetous hands on whatever caught their fancy. But it wasn't just looting. In accounts after account, Mennonites state that during the massacre, they had recognized many perpetrators as familiar faces coming from nearby Ukrainian villages. In fact, the evidence of their neighbors participating in the massacre is so overwhelming that the Mennonite historian David Rempel wrote, Actually, it is safe to assume that many of the worst excesses in Eichenfeld were carried out by peasants of the neighboring villages. Rempel writes that his cousin Cornelius Heinrichs was also, quote, of the firm opinion that responsibility for Eichenfeld's nightmarish experience rested more with the neighboring peasants than with the Machnavashina. Mennonites were unanimous that the perpetrators that they recognized were from the Ukrainian villages of Novopetrovka, Fedorovka, Augustinovka, and Zlukashovo. Furthermore, a man named Heinrich Friesen interviewed survivors in the 1920s. One Mennonite he interviewed stated that the massacre had been planned in Lukashovo. Sean Patterson researched this massacre more than anyone I know. He wrote, From the surviving accounts, it appears that the attackers were following orders to exclusively execute landowning males and their sons. The reasoning behind this was likely to eliminate any Mennonite's claim to ownership over the land. But why eliminate the Mennonites' claim to the land? Well, it's because these nearby villagers wanted to take over the land for themselves, and that is exactly what ended up happening. When the survivors had fled to Adelsheim, guess who moved in? That's right, their Ukrainian neighbors. Marianne Jansen wrote, Russians began to live in the houses, but they found the large brick homes too expensive to heat and tore them down, using the bricks to build smaller homes. The trees that had been so lovingly planted and cared for were now used for firewood. The gardens, once so immaculate, now boasted of tall weeds. The Mennonites referred to this village as Macnosdorf. They did not want to return as there were too many horrible memories that could never be erased. With the area under Macnavist occupation, nearby villagers likely took advantage of the Macnavist presence and opportunistically asked for their help in the destruction of Eichenfeld. We know for certain that neighboring peasants were responsible for other massacres of Mennonites. For example, in the massacre of Zakhardovka, the Ukrainian peasants in Shesterna had asked the Maknavists to completely wipe out the Mennonite village of Muensterberg because they wanted land to expand. Over 98 Mennonites died in Muensterberg alone, 41 of whom were children. David Rempel was correct when he attributed the attackers' motivations to the sheer lust and pleasure of easy looting to their heart's content and the loot and land hunger of the neighboring peasantry. These nearby Ukrainian neighbors had traded with the Mennonites, worked alongside the Mennonites, and had been their neighbors for decades. But over time, these neighbors had grown deep feelings of envy, jealousy, and resentment towards their more prosperous Mennonite neighbors. Long before the war, the Russian peasant was already casting envious glances at the much more prosperous colonist, who only too often was his employer. Gerhard Lorenz wrote that the war with Germany created hatred towards all ethnic Germans, and that, added to this, came the envy and the jealousy. Most Germans living in Russia were materially wealthier than the average Russian. These pre-existing resentments over economic inequalities were only exacerbated by the Bolsheviks' nationwide class war of dekulakization, ruthless war on the kulaks, death to them, plunder the plunderer, do not care about what you do. This violent revolutionary rhetoric only inflamed their sense of victimhood and created a desire for vengeance, which was released amid the encouragement of the Bolsheviks and the breakdown of law and order.
Some have speculated that the massacre was retaliation for actions of self-defense, but we now know that the local peasants were the primary instigators. And furthermore, there were other massacres of Mennonites who had never defended themselves and had remained pacifist, like the massacres in the Borisenko colony, where the pacifist villages of Steinbach and Edenfeld were annihilated. Three days after the massacre, on November 11th, the survivors returned to Eichenfeld with other Mennonites. Over half the victims had been hacked to death with sabers, making some bodies unrecognizable. Most of the bodies were in their underwear, because their killers had robbed their clothes before murdering them. Bodies and body parts were collected and buried in twelve mass graves, father beside son, relative beside relative. The bodies were not washed or dressed and no service was held because bandits still roamed nearby. After the burial, most Mennonites fled, but some remained, and when bandits returned, these Mennonites were slaughtered. In the following week, the death toll rose from 84 to 136 Mennonites throughout the entire Yasikovo colony. Thank you for watching this video all the way until the end. If you value this work, please consider supporting me by donating on PayPal, Bitcoin, or by becoming a Patreon, where you can reach out to me and where all the videos are ad-free. Whether you pledge $1 or $10 or whatever you can spare, it all helps cover the costs that go into making these videos.